Great, thanks um, Philip and Oshin. That's going to be a very difficult act to follow, but we'll try. Um, so when we we're trying to come up with a topic for this particular panel, we were trying to think of an area that was relevant for all organizations in all sectors, but also an area that was on the DPC's radar at the moment. And we thought that data breach reporting ticked all of those boxes quite nicely. We're continuing to see a significant amount of activity in terms of the volume of data breaches reported to the DPC. So in 2022, we saw 6,000 data breaches reported to the DPC. Um, that's actually a 12% decrease on last year. And that's no surprise given that we're five years into the GDPR. So you'd hope that organizations are putting in place better measures to prevent data breaches from taking place in the first place. Um, those, of those 6,000 data breaches reported to the DPC, over 50% of those were reported by the public sector organizations and organizations in the charities and the voluntary sector. In the private sector, most of the data breach reports are made by financial institutions, insurance companies, and telecoms. Then in terms of the nature of the data breaches that we saw reported in 2022, about 62% of those breaches related to unauthorized disclosure by email or unauthorized disclosure by post. So somebody putting the wrong letter in the wrong envelope or an email going to the wrong recipient because of an autofill issue. Interestingly, only 4% of those breaches related to hacking. And I thought that was a really interesting statistic because I think it demonstrates that organizations are probably spending a lot of time and resources on sophisticated IT systems but they're probably not spending enough time on putting in place practical organizational measures to prevent the type of human error breaches that occur commonly in most organizations. In terms then of DPC activity, we saw 10 decisions issued by the DPC in 2022 in large scale data breach cases. And we've seen two decisions issued so far in 2023. And we do expect that level of activity to continue into the future. The DPC confirmed at a conference last week in San Francisco that data breach reporting is going to continue to be on its radar for the next few years. So we're going to look today at your obligations to um, notify data breaches, and we're also going to look at some steps you can take to mitigate damage suffered to data subjects. But Brian, before we do that, you might maybe briefly go into the topic of what actually constitutes a data breach, because I know there's some confusion sometimes on that. Yeah, thanks, Judy. So the concept of a personal data breach has been evolving over the last five years. And similar to concepts like controllership and personal data, it's actually expanding. And the driver for that expansion is very much the protection um, of data subjects against risks. Where the DPC feels it needs to expand the concept to protect data subjects, it will. Um, and it's actually gone a little further. And it's recently expressly uh, cautioned controllers against taking what it considers overly technical interpretations of personal data breaches, or looking at parts of its prior decisions that found something was or wasn't a personal data breach, and relying on that as setting the absolute limits on what this concept is. And they're really pushing for a broader, more holistic view of the concept and asking, what does the concept need to be to best protect data subjects? Um, and one area where we're seeing that in particular is how the DPC looks at the concept of breach of security. So this is an important part of the definition in Article 412. Um, there needs to be a breach of security that then leads to one of the specified impacts, things like unauthorized disclosure, accidental alteration, but it's actually glossed over quite a lot in practice, um, with the focus really being on those impacts. And there's you know, some confusion as to what breach of security means. Is it a breach of Article 32? Is it an inherently technical breach? Um, and the DPCs looked at this recently and essentially rejected a lot of those interpretations. Um, they point to the fact personal data breach has essentially three aspects. First, there must be an incident of some kind that can be entirely internal or it can also be external. There must be an impact on personal data, one of those specified in Article 412, so something like unauthorized disclosure. And then the final part, the breach of security, they say is an inab inability of your network or your systems to withstand the impact. So essentially, if the impact um, hasn't been prevented by your systems, that's a personal data breach. They said breach of security can't mean Article 32 um, compliance because it could lead to unusual outcomes. A controller could do everything right, but nevertheless suffer a very sophisticated attack, exposing millions of records. 
and they wouldn't need to notify if breach of security meant Article 32 compliance. They are also making very clear it's not just a technical issue, it could also be an organisational issue. And as you pointed out, Julie, maybe that's an area where people are not focusing enough. Um, so it's really important, again, to look at that holistic view of breach of security and make sure you're, you're taking all those into account. Um, so in essence, the DPC's position is if something has gone wrong and personal data has been impacted, it's probably going to be a personal data breach. Now, I think you need, really need to question that interpretation because to my mind, it renders that breach of security, which is a deliberate part of the definition, pretty meaningless because the focus is really just on the impacts. But nevertheless, that is the DPC's view. And until a court says otherwise, that is the working interpretation. And when you're making those big calls, you know, is this a personal data breach or not? It's really important to have that DPC interpretation in mind because the fact that you're notifying a personal data breach doesn't actually mean you haven't complied with your obligations. If there's a, a significant incident affecting individuals, it'll probably become public. Actually, the last thing you probably want to do is take an overly technical interpretation of a personal data breach and then for the DPC to look into what you've done and find, okay, maybe you complied with Article 32, but actually you didn't comply with Article 33 or Article 34. Um, so you really need to bear that in mind when you're looking at um, breach notification and making those big calls and actually asking yourself, are these the facts I really want to be defending a technical interpretation? Should I be saving the fight and arguing, actually, I did everything I could, the breach happened anyway, um, but I still complied with my obligations. So if you do decide a personal data breach has taken place, notification is the next big thing on your list. Yep, so there's two obligations under the GDPR to report data breaches. The first is to notify the Data Protection Commission where there's a risk to data subjects, and that report has to be made within 72 hours of you becoming aware of the breach. And then the second obligation is to report to data subjects where there's a high risk. And I think everybody is fairly familiar with those concepts now, five years into the GDPR. But something that we're asked a lot about is when does that 72 hours start to tick? When does the clock start to tick? Um, so effectively, we've had a number of decisions over the last few years, and also the European Data Protection Board guidelines that issued in March of this year, which touch upon this um, topic. So under the European Data Protection Board guidelines that were recently issued, the 72 hours starts to um, tick once you have a reasonable degree of certainty that a data breach occurred. So the guidelines envisage that you'll have a short period of time to carry out an investigation to determine whether the security incident constitutes a data breach. And during that period, you won't be deemed to be aware. But it's very important that that initial investigation is carried out very swiftly. And as soon as you have a reasonable certainty that there was a data breach that you report to the DPC, and then any longer investigation that is needed can be carried out thereafter. We've also seen um, recently the Teaching Council decision. And in that case, the DPC said that the date of awareness is not the date that you actually became of the data, aware of the data breach, it's the date you ought to have been aware of the data breach. So in that case, the, the council suffered from a, in, their systems had been infiltrated due to a phishing attack. Um, and they didn't become aware of this for a period of two months. They reported it to the DPC within 72 hours of becoming aware of it. The DPC, however, said that had they had certain measures in place, they would have detected the breach sooner. And therefore, they, the date that the 72 hours started to tick was the date that they ought to have found the data breach, not the date they actually um, found the data breach. So that was a very interesting decision. We also have the Twitter decision. And in that case, the DPC found that the date of awareness is the, the date that your processor um, finds the data breach, not the date that the processor informs the controller of the data breach. So in that case, we had Twitter Inc, who was the process for Twitter Ireland, and they found a software bug in December. They subsequently determined in, on the 3rd of January that that was likely to uh, have involved a data breach, and they informed their controller, Twitter Ireland, on the 7th of January. Now, there had been some delays in informing the controller due to the, public, uh, due to the holiday period, but also um, they omitted to include the Ireland DPO in a JIRA ticket that had been raised in relation to the breach. Um, Twitter acted very quickly. They reported to the DPC the following day on the 8th of January, but the DPC found that 
The date of awareness was at the latest, the 3rd of January, when the processor um, decided that it was likely to constitute a data breach. So again, um, a very interesting decision there. My takeaways from that are, one, make sure you have proper systems in place to detect breaches swiftly. Um, two, make sure that you carry out any initial investigation really swiftly and report to the DPC as soon as possible. And thirdly, make sure your processors are doing the same. Make sure they have procedures in place to detect um, breaches and make sure they're reporting to you quickly and have an incident response procedure in place with them and audit that procedure to make sure it's working. Um, I think, Brian, the need to have robust measures in place to kind of detect breaches is probably going to be all the more important now that we have the impending data um, breach finding guidelines coming. Yeah, that's right. So the EDPB finding guidelines have now been adopted and um, they're not published unless they've been published uh, while I've been up here and um, they weren't as of this morning anyway. Um, so we need to see the final detail. But I think what's clear is that we're going to be seeing fines that are likely many multiples of the fines that have been imposed um, to date. This applies to both domestic processing, but also cross-border processing. They don't apply to public authorities. So the 1 million euro cap should con uh, continue to apply um, as provided for under the Act. But there is a reference in the guidelines to um, possibly different methodologies being set up for, for public authorities. And I think these are generally going to pose serious challenges for companies, just given the scale of the fines. But I think it has the potential to produce pretty unfair and disproportionate fines in a, in a breach uh, of security context. And there's no distinction in the guidelines between you know, different types of infringements. And the reason I, I think that that's the case, it, it's the way the, um, the finding guidelines work and the prescriptive methodology that it sets out. The central premise of the guidelines is to identify a consistent starting point that is linked to the turnover of the organization. So you work out that starting point um, by identifying what's the absolute maximum fine that could be imposed in a particular case. So for example, whether an infringement is subject to or 4% of that maximum turnover. And then the next step, you have to work out how serious is the infringement. And the guidelines say that you can have low, medium, or high levels of serious. For a low level of seriousness, um, you have zero to 10% of that absolute maximum. For medium, it's 10 to 20%. And for serious, high level of serious, you have 20 all the way up to the, the maximum, 100% um, of the the cap, whether that's two or 4%. So as you can see, even with low level serious fines, once you're talking about a percentage of that maximum cap, you get into really very significant uh, potential fines being imposed. And um, the other challenge then is that in calculating seriousness, the EDPB has said that you only look at three factors. You don't look at all the factors under Article 83.2. You only look at uh, 83.2 A, B, and G. And those are factors that go to the nature of the infringement and the damage suffered by data subjects, whether the infringement was intentional or negligent, um, and the categories of data that have been impacted. Now, anyone who's dealt with a breach, they're not three factors that are probably going to be in your favor in a, in a breach context. But those are the ones that are used to calculate um, the starting point. And so the difficulty is you could be left in a situation where there's this really high um, starting point that you're battling against and to try and reduce down. Um, now, I think fines based on turnover are problematic generally. There doesn't seem to be anything in the GDPR that supports it. It's not um, required or supported by the text. But I think it's particularly strained in the context of a breach of security infringements. Unlike, for example, competition law infringements, which have really inspired this methodology, where infringements are directly linked to revenue generation activities, that's really not the case for a breach of security. And so it seems really inappropriate that the revenue would be used as a basis for calculation um, in, in those contexts. And um, the other challenge then is the guidelines actually provide only limited other opportunities to reduce the fine down. Um, and two of those, and to come back to the point Julie made, really revolve around how you respond to a breach of security and how you mitigate damage. So articles 83.2c and 83.2f are likely to be um, the most important for you in a, in a breach mitigation context. And the first one there is all about actions you've taken to mitigate damage. 
What have you done to you know, rapidly fix the issue, notify data subjects, provide them with adv advice on how to protect themselves, and any other steps that, that you can take? And they have to be of your own volition and go beyond what you're required to do under GDPR in order to, to benefit from the mitigation. Then Article 83.2F is what was your level of cooperation with the supervisory authority, so the DPC, in order to mitigate adverse effects. So again, this is more than just complying with your obligations. What have you done to you know, actively take steps to mitigate the infringement, to mitigate harm to data subjects? Um, and these are important factors that um, you'll really be relying on to try and tackle that really high starting point because it's gonna be a really uphill battle once that starting point is in place to then try and bring it down. So I think now more than ever, Julie, I think it's really important that you have policies in place to be able to react quickly and put in place really effective mitigations. Yep. So just before dealing with mitigations that you can put in place after you discover a breach, the first thing that the DPC will do when they're looking at a breach is they'll look at what technical and organizational measures you had in the organization prior to the breach taking place. And that's going to be the key area that they're going to focus on to see if there was a breach of Article 32, the security obligations. Um, a good example of this um, can be found in a decision last year involving an insurance company. And in that particular case, the DPC actually found there was no breach of Article 32 because of the steps that the organization had taken prior to the breach taking place. In this particular breach, the organization had notified a number of data breaches to the DPC. And these were human error type breaches that um, unauthorized disclosure by way of email or unauthorized disclosure by way of post. Um, the DPC, in making a finding that there was no infringement, took into account the fact that the organization had a data protection governance structure in place with three lines of defense. They also had um, data breach training in place for staff, um, in place both at the induction stage and annually. They also had a data breach blog, which was available on the company's intranet. They also had an email policy, which covered the transmission of emails externally. Um, they also had a policy in place for the sending of documents by post, and there were spot checks um, carried out in, in relation to that policy on a weekly basis. They also had on their email system a tool that popped up reminding our, uh, individuals to check the recipient of emails before it, it was sent to make sure there was no autofill type issues. Um, they also had a data classification policy, which categorized documents, whether they were internal, um, external, public, um, prior, confidential or strictly confidential. And depending on their classification, a different level of security um, was required in relation to those documents. So all of those steps um, were very useful in trying in defending that particular inquiry. Where there is a finding of an infringement, as Brian mentioned, the DPC will look at what types of steps that the organization took after they discovered the breach in deciding the level of fine to be applied. Um, in the Marriott case in the UK, the ICO took into account the fact that the Marriott had set up a dedicated website where customers could find more information in relation to the breach. They also set up a dedicated call center where customers could ring for further information. They engaged in widespread media campaign to um, raise awareness of the issue. They also um, carried out a number of password resets. They disabled compromised accounts. They provided web monitoring for the affected data subjects. Um, they also had uh, live monitoring and forensic tools on over 70,000 devices. And they also had reported the breach to a number of other regulators and to law enforcement. And because all, all of those steps had been taken, the fine in that case was actually reduced by 20% or 5 million sterling. Um, closer to home then, we had another decision last year involving a public sector organization. And in that case, there was um, a data breach because records were disposed of in a public um, recycling center. And in that case, the DPC reduced the fine by 25,000 euro. And in doing so, they took into account the fact that the organization in question carried out a detailed search of the area where the documents were found to make sure there were no further documents there. They also saw commitments from the individual who found the documentation that it had not been copied or it had not been transmitted to a third party. And then finally, the organization had also carried out a detailed investigation 
um, and made some recommendations to mitigate risk going forward. So it was a le lesson learned type exercise which all organizations should carry out. Um, another really interesting decision which actually went the other way um, is the Centric Health decision. And this is a decision from this year. In this case, the DPC actually found that Centric Health had aggravated the damage to data, sub to data subjects. So in that case, um, Centric Health discovered a, a security incident and they performed a, re a system reset. And by doing so, they had deleted logging data on the system. And they did this before the forensic analysis took place. Because the logging data was no longer available, the forensic team couldn't identify the initial point of attack. And the DPC, D DPC said that by doing this, um, the Centric Health had removed information that would have been very helpful in understanding the true extent of the breach. And therefore, they had um, aggravated damage to data subjects. Um, another interesting aspect of that decision, actually, is the fact that Centric Health had paid a ransom for the return of a, for a decryptor key. Um, the DPC didn't comment on that at all in its decision. They didn't seem to take it into account when determining mitigation steps, which I thought was um, interesting. At least they didn't say it in their decision. Um, so, Great. Yeah. Thanks very much, Julie. Um, very helpful practical tips. Um, so I think we do have some time um, for a couple of questions. Um, so I might take, take one. Um, so the question is, are there risks with over-reporting if you're unsure if something is a breach? Um, I think there probably are some risks to that um, the, that need to be weighed against the risks that I mentioned earlier of taking an overly technical breach. So there's no infringement per se of um, over-reporting, but what it does is it certainly could bring you onto the radar of the DPC. It could invite them to scrutinize the measures that you had in place at the time. Um, and I think, you know, as Julie mentioned earlier, breach reporting is going down. And I think it's probably the case that there is a certain wariness. Controllers being maybe a little bit more confident in their view of what breach of security are and not wanting to invite um, the DPC in to, to look under the hood. Um, but I think it really comes down to a judgment call. You need to be asking yourself, you know, what's the risk here to data subjects that you might want the DPC to be aware? How likely is it going to be that you're going to, it's going to become public anyway um, and you don't want to be defending an overly technical interpretation, and really, how confident are you of the measures that you had in place at the time of the breach? The more confident you are, you did everything right, and the more likely you are probably to be comfortable notifying. Um, and there's actually a recent advocate general opinion which sheds some useful insight into what Article 32 is. It contains some very helpful statements, such as it, it would be illogical to think that Article 32, the objective of it was to prevent security breaches. Um, it makes clear that there is a proportionality aspect to it, and it points to things like cost and um, you know, capacity of the controller to put measures in place and risk. So these are all important questions. It also identifies the importance of adhering to codes and certifications as being ways to demonstrate that you've complied. So you can't you know, necessarily prevent or prepare for every security incident, but what you can do is prepare to be compliant um, and put in place measures um, that you can defend and really defend against heavy scrutiny from the DPC, and that's possibly where you should be focusing your energies. Great. Do we have time for another question? Okay. Um, so, are there any laws that are relevant from? Uh, or, sorry, are there any other laws that are relevant from a security perspective? Um, yeah. So there is the the law enforcement directive. Firstly, um, so that applies to competent authorities who are processing data for. Um, the detection or investigation or prosecution of criminal offences. The LED contains breach reporting requirements. It really applies to organisations like um, GSOC, Garda Síochána, the Irish Prison Service, um, certain departments of state. So that's one. Another regime um, is NIS. So NIS applies to operators of essential services and digital service providers. Again, that contains incident reporting requirements. And we're actually going to have NIST 2 coming down the tracks as well. Um, that's going to come into place in 2024. It has to be transposed into Irish law in 2024. And that's going to um, put in place more stringent reporting requirements. We also have um, DORA coming down the tracks as well. That's the Digital Operational Resilience Act. 
Um, again, it's not a law that's currently in place. It's going to be coming into place in 2025. And that's going to contain certain security requirements for network and information systems for financial entities. And again, there's going to be obligations to report security incidents. There is also e-privacy. Um, so e-privacy contains obligations on telecoms and internet service providers to report data breaches to the DPC. Let me think, there's also so many out there. And there's also um, the telecoms framework. So that also will cover, so telecoms have to report incidents to Comreg. Um, so, get, so there's quite a lot of other regimes that we all have to bear in mind when we're thinking about breach reports and incident reports. So I think we're down to the wire. Great, thanks very much. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next panel now. So it's um, Melanie Crowley, who's the head of our employment and benefit team, and Rob McDonough, a partner in our privacy and data security team. Melanie heads up a team of 30 lawyers who advise on all things employment and often get dragged into data protection issues. So she's going to be grilling Rob on data subject access requests. 